Okay, now we're going to move through this, this phylogenetic tree. We're looking at the echidozoans now. So we covered all of the lophotrochozoans. Now we're going to look at the echidozoans, which would be the nematodes, <clears throat> excuse me, and the arthropods. And then lastly, we'll cover the deuterostomes, echinoderms, and the chordates. So nematodes next. So these are echidozoans. The main characteristic of echidozoans is that they have to shed their exoskeletons in order to grow. So that would be the roundworms as well as the arthropods that we'll talk about next. So roundworms are not segmented. So we just talked about the annelids that were segmented worms. The, the nematodes are roundworms. They do not have segments. They are mostly small, free-living worms found in pretty much any environment you can think of. We find them in soils, we find them in water, we find them in salt water, fresh water, we find them living in vinegar. So there are all different types of roundworms that can pretty much live anywhere. And there are free living as well as parasitic species. So here are a few examples of parasitic roundworms. We have pinworms. Now pinworms are really common even in the United States. They are a very small worm that lives in the large intestine, lives in the colon of a human host. And at night, the female worm migrates her way out of the anus and deposits her eggs around the rim of the anus. Very common in children, but adults can get it too, particularly if you have children or, uh, for example, like kindergarten teachers, it's not uncommon. So when the eggs get deposited around the rim of the anus, it causes that migration back and forth because then the female worms migrate back into the colon as morning approaches. That migration causes itching. Well, particularly with children, they reach back and scratch. When you have an itch, you scratch it, and then they get the eggs on their hands. And then those eggs are deposited all around their environment, on the furniture, on toys, on their friends when they're sticking their hands in each other's mouths, all those sorts of things. And that's how it's transmitted because it's ingesting of the eggs that continues the life cycle. Elephantiasis is what you see here. Now elephantiasis is a roundworm. It's a roundworm that infects lymph glands. And so it goes to the lymph glands, which means that the lymph nodes cannot um, remove waste from the body. In the lymph glands, that's where your immune system is working, your immune system is removing bacteria that might be causing an illness or viruses that might be causing an illness, and then that material has to be filtered through your lymph glands and then excreted through the lymph system and ultimately out of the body. Well, this is a worm that attacks the lymph glands, which means it causes fluid to build up. The, it blocks off the lymph gl glands, and so the fluid can't get through, and so it builds up. So most of the swelling here is fluid. This isn't worm, but it's fluid that backs up because the lymph glands are blocked. And then the guinea worm, I'm going to show you the life cycle of that in just a moment. And then Ascaris, this is a round worm. It's maybe about six or eight inches long. It infects the small intestine of its mammalian host. There is one species of Ascaris that infects humans, and you can see how many worms can be packed into the small intestine. It does not attach to the wall of the small intestine like tapeworms do. It stays in place by constantly swimming. So it's constantly in motion, so it's constantly swimming to prevent it from being washed out of the body. Now, we can treat Ascaris. As I said, it, it does. there is a species that infects humans, not very common in the United States, but it does exist. We have treatment for it. You take medicine, it kills them, and then you have to pass the worms. The problem is, though, is that the medicine that we would take to kill these worms, we don't want to take too much because it can harm the host. It can harm the patient. But if you don't take enough to kill the worm, then you're going to aggravate the worms. And because they're not attached, they can swim. So they can swim one direction and exit the body through the anus alive. They can swim in the other direction, enter into the stomach, come up the esophagus, come out of the nose and into the mouth. So all of those things are not what you want to happen. So you have to make sure you get the attention of a doctor who knows what he or she is doing. 
Now this is showing the life cycle of a guinea worm. So the life cycle of the guinea worm, you can see here that what happens is humans ingest eggs by drinking contaminated water. So water that has not been treated, again, not very good sanitation practices, developing countries is where it's most common. So drinking contaminated water, you ingest the eggs, those eggs travel to the small intestine, that's where reproduction happens, and then the females travel out of the small intestine to the surface of the skin to release her eggs. And so you can see it causes kind of a blister, and then the female sticks out just a little bit, releases her eggs so that when you're walking through water, those eggs are released into the water column and then there's an intermediate host and then we can again re-ingest the eggs or the larva through the contaminated water. So you can see what's happening here. Again, this is developing country. The way that they remove these worms from the person who is infected is by when the female just starts releasing, coming out of the surface to deposit her eggs, you can spiral it around a stick and very gently remove it from the body. Okay, the second group of the second phylum that's included as the echidozoans is phylum arthropoda. So arthropoda means jointed foot. So arthro, jointed, poda, foot. So these are, it's a very large group of animals and they all have jointed feet. So they have paired jointed feet. They have a segmented body. We talked about the um, annelids being segmented worms. Those were segmented like you see here on this millipede. But segmented body plan doesn't necessarily mean little tiny segments like you see here. It's also a segmented body where we have with insects, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So distinct body regions, distinct body segments. So segmented body, head, thorax, abdomen, or some of them are fused, as in spiders. They have fused body parts, so they don't have those three distinct body parts. Um, so a pair of jointed appendages. They have exoskeletons, again, that they have to shed in order to grow. They have compound, complex eyes. The groups that, that are included in arthropods are the chelicerates. Here you can see the black where those spiders that chelicerate. These are spiders, ticks, mites, scorpions. They all have pinching mouth parts um, or pinching appendages to use to subdue their prey or capture their prey. That would be chelicerates. The myriapods. These are the millipedes and centipedes. So I'm showing you a millipede here. The difference between a millipede and a centipede. So they are both highly segmented. They each have many legs. So I didn't mention that here with the chelicerates. Depending on the group, they can have uh, eight legs, four pairs, or five pairs of legs in the scorpions. So, um, but with the millipedes and the centipedes, they have many pairs of legs. Millipedes will have two pairs of appendages per body segment. So two on this side, two on the other side. So four legs per body segment. Centipedes, they don't have a hundred legs. Millipedes don't have a thousand legs, but the centipedes have one pair of legs per body segment. So one on each side. So Millipedes are called millipedes because it looks like they have a million legs. They have a lot more than centipedes because they have two pairs per segment, whereas centipedes only have one pair per segment. And centipedes tend to be poisonous. They can bite, they can sting. Millipedes are completely harmless. Crustaceans, these are our crabs, shrimp, crayfish. Again, exoskeleton, they have to shed that to grow. If ever you like to eat soft shell crabs, your, the, the, the shell is soft because the crab has just molted. It has shed its exoskeleton. The skeleton underneath is soft and it takes a little while to harden. And when we get a soft shell crab, we're capturing it during that very vulnerable phase in its, in its growth period. And then hexapods. The hexapods are the insects. They have six legs, three pairs of legs, 
and a huge, very successful group of animals. Okay, so that includes all the echidozoans, that includes all of the lophotrochozoans. Now we're going to look at the deuterostomes. Now remember deuterostomes, the difference between the protostomes and the deuterostomes is that the deuterostomes during embryological development, the first opening, that blastopore, that first opening in the digestive tract is the anus. So the two remaining phyla, echinoderms and the chordates are both deuterostomes. We're going to talk about the echinoderms now. So phylum echinodermata. Echinodermata, derm always means skin. Echinodermata means spiny skin. They actually have an endoskeleton. So everything that we've been talking about so far as far as skeletons are concerned are either no skeleton at all, like the jellyfish or sponges, or they have an exoskeleton, like the insects or crabs or the shell of a mollusk. This is the first group that actually has an endoskeleton, a skeleton inside its body with skin on the outside. It's not, it's not a vertebrate. It doesn't have a spinal column. It doesn't have bones. It has interlocking plates that are like a shell, but it's still underneath the skin. And so we call that an endoskeleton. They have tube feet and a water vascular system I'll show you in just a moment. The adults are radial. They have back evolved to radial symmetry, but the larvae are bilateral. And so you can see by this previous phylogenetic tree that chordates, which is what humans are included in, are very closely related to the echinoderms. So echinoderms are our closest ancestor that's not a chordate. So the phylum that's more, most closely related to the chordates are echinoderms. And when you look at an echinoderm, they look very primitive. We're talking about sea stars, uh, sea urchins, and sand dollars. You know, these look very primitive because of that radial symmetry. But they're actually more closely related to humans than we realize. They evolved back to the radial symmetry because they're slow moving and they just didn't need that bilateral predator uh, design. So this is looking at the water vascular system of echinoderms. And what that means is they have a series of water tubes or tubes throughout the, the body of the animal where fluid can flow. And those, that water vascular system is connected with tube feet. And so the animal can push fluid down each of the arms, or in the case of the sea urchin or the sand dollar, throughout the body of the animal which causes the extension of these little tube feet that allows it to slowly move in one direction or the other. So if ever you have found a starfish in the ocean or on the beach, usually if you were to find it, it's just a skeleton that is remaining. Remember that skeleton is just underneath the surface. And so if you find a hard starfish or you see a hard starfish in a, in a surf shop somewhere, that's just the skeleton, all the soft tissue is removed or has decomposed. But if you find one that's alive and you pick it up, suddenly the little feet will start moving and they'll stick to your hand because they're like these little plunges and they can gradually move. Now they do have a complete digestive system. You can see the anus is shown here. The mouth is on the undersurface of the animal. What the starfish does to digest or to eat larger animals is it actually can push its stomach outside of its mouth, can push its stomach through its mouth and then release digestive enzymes onto its prey and then digest it and then that way able to ingest broken down parts of the animal that it's preying on. And then the wastes are released through the top of the animal through the anus. Okay, I'm going to stop there because the next phylum we're going to talk about are the chordates. And so we'll spend the rest of the time talking about chordates.